All right, turn with me to Daniel chapter 7. If you guys don't mind, turn into Daniel chapter 7. You'll remember that last week we started Daniel chapter 7. However, we did not finish Daniel chapter 7 last week, which is uh, to be expected. But turn with me there, and then I'm also going to ask you to uh, find a couple spots in your Bible. One is Revelation chapter 5. So if you'll turn to Revelation chapter 5, you can mark that in your Bible. And hold your place in Daniel chapter 7. That's where we're going to be for the majority of our study tonight. But I do want to start in Revelation chapter 5. So if you'll just turn there with me. Remember last week that we, uh, in Daniel, we started, uh, Daniel had a vision. And we've started the prophetic section of Daniel, right? So the first six chapters of Daniel have been a narrative, right? It's been basically a strict narrative. There's been some prophecy in there, but mostly it's narrative. It's a story, right? It, it's the history of Daniel. It's his account. It's his account, in ba- uh, his account of its time in Babylon and, and the captivity of the Jewish people in Babylon. And then in Daniel chapter 7, we've ended the narrative of Daniel. The story of Daniel has ended, in a sense. And we're looking back at, we're going back in the timeline of, of the book of Daniel in his life. And now we're looking at narrative, I mean, uh, prophetic experiences that Daniel's had. He's showing us a vision now in the first year of Belshazzar. Now you'll remember that Belshazzar fell and Babylon fell and the Medo-Persian Empire came in and took over Babylon at the end of Daniel chapter 6, I'm sorry, at the end of Daniel chapter 5, and then in Daniel chapter 6, we've had this Medo-Persian Empire with Darius reigning, and so now we're looking back into the history of Daniel between chapters 4 and 5 of Daniel, and we're seeing this experience that Daniel has, and he's given us this account of it. And you'll remember in Daniel chapter 7, the vision, right? We, we went over the vision last week. We saw the vision, and in the vision, Daniel sees four beasts, right? The first is like a lion. It's not a lion. Okay, I want, I want you to remember that. That the beast that Daniel sees is not a lion. It's like a lion. Daniel's explaining it to us in the very best way he can, but it's not a wild animal. He's seeing a beast. The first one is like a lion. The second one is like a bear. The third one is like a leopard. But you'll see that the leopard has four heads. It has, it has the uh, wings of a bird. It's not a leopard. It's like a leopard. And all of those four beasts, all of those uh, three beasts, I'm sorry, are describing an empire, a Gentile empire. And remember, this, this vision that Daniel has in chapter 7 is a parallel vision to what Nebuchadnezzar has in chapter 2, when Nebuchadnezzar has that dream of this image with the golden head, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, legs and feet of iron and clay, and toes mixed with clay, Right? That was four Gentile empires that would rule the world. Remember when we said in chapter 2 that it was a very sweeping uh, vision, a very sweeping prophecy. In fact, the book of Daniel has the farthest reaching prophecies of all the prophecies in the Old Testament. It's spanning from 605 B.C. at the Babylonian captivity until the coming of the Messianic kingdom. Okay? Not... it, it, It... it's, it is even reaching into the future from where we are right now. So it encompasses all of human history from 605 B.C. all the way until the coming, the, the consummation of the kingdom of Christ. And then in Daniel chapter 7, we have that parallel vision, the same vision that Nebuchadnezzar has, only now it's from God's perspective. Daniel being a godly man, God giving him the vision from his own perspective. Now in the perspective of men, this these ancient empires, these great Gentile empires, were a great image, this amazing, awe-inspiring image, right? But from the perspective of God, they are beasts, wild, untamed, chaotic beasts. And so, in Daniel chapter 7, we saw these first three beasts come and go off the scene, and then the fourth beast arise after the third beast. Now, this beast was unlike any other that you had seen before, right? It was not like any of the beasts that had come before it. It was unique. It had teeth of, and claws of iron and bronze, right? This amazing beast that tramples the residue with its feet. It destroys, it utterly destroys 
everything that had come before. Now remember we said that that beast was the Roman Empire. You'll remember when we went through that in Daniel chapter 2, this Roman Empire, right? That was unlike any of the empires that had come before it. It had given birth to the, to the system of imperialism. It ruled and reigned in a way that no other empire before it had ruled and reigned. It, it had an expanse of the kingdom larger than all of the empires that had come before it. It reigned for longer than all of the empires that had come before it. It was more powerful than all the empires that had come before it. This amazing Roman Empire that went from when it took over the, uh, the Greek Empire all the way until 1450 A.D. It's over a 1500 year reign of the Roman Empire. Now, then, after this fourth empire, right, something interesting that we get in Daniel chapter 7 that we don't get in Daniel chapter 4 is this ten horns. Now remember, I mean, I'm sorry, in Daniel chapter 2. In Daniel chapter 2, we have the ten toes. But then when we move into Daniel chapter 7, these ten toes are now portrayed as ten horns. These horns are ten kings that arise out of the kingdom. And then we see one little horn, a different horn, something that comes up from the midst of the ten. And this little horn grows, and then it rips up three horns from its roots. It takes the place of the three horns. It's this usurping power of this little horn. And in this little horn were eyes like a man and a mouth like a man. And it was speaking pompous words. And this little horn is none other than the Antichrist. In Daniel chapter 7, we have it called the little horn. Again, in Daniel chapter 9, or I'm sorry, in Daniel chapter, uh, one of those chapters, he calls him the king of fierce countenance. In uh, it's, John, in his first epistle to the general public, to the general church, he calls him the Antichrist. Yeah, the, it, Paul calls him the man of sin, the son of perdition. He's called many things in the Bible, from the Old Testament reaching through the New Testament, but he is none other than the Antichrist. Now, when you think about the Antichrist, often we think about the Antichrist wrong, right? We think about the Antichrist as the opposite of Christ. That he comes and he's evil when he comes and he is just oozing evil and you can spot him right away because he's got 666 on his forehead, right? No. The Antichrist, what Antichrist means is another Christ. It means an alternate to Christ. Now, he's not the opposite of, there is no opposite of Jesus, by the way. God has no opposite. Satan is not the opposite of God. God is holy, holy, holy. He stands apart from all of creation. There is God, and then there's everything else. The Antichrist, though, comes on the scene, and he gains popularity, and he gains a following by offering another way, an alternate to Jesus. And so we see him, this little horn, and he's rising to power. But what I love about Daniel chapter 7 is we see the end goal. We see the end of things. Remember, Daniel chapter 7 is the farthest reaching prophecy in all of history. It sets up and lays down for us all of human history from 605 B.C. into the consummation of the kingdom of Jesus. It, it, it shows us everything is the furthest sweeping, overreaching prophecy in all of the Old Testament, all of the New Testament. And then when we get to, in Daniel chapter 7, we see the coming of Christ, right? We see the Ancient of Days, and He sets up His throne, His throne is set up. Then they hold court, and, and Daniel says he's watching because of the pompous words that the little horn was speaking. Now the little horn sets himself up to be worshipped as God. He shows himself to be God, and he sets himself up to be worshipped as God. Daniel will call that the abomination of desolation. And so he demands worship. Now as all this is going on, Daniel is showing us what's happening in the kingdom of heaven. Daniel is th showing us what's happening in the throne room of the Ancient of Days. I love that, that name of God. The Ancient of Days. Before there was ever a day, he's even ancient before that. Before time was even ever created, God was. In the beginning, was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. In the beginning, before, everything was, before there was anything ever made, there was God. He's the Ancient of Days. 
He's the Father of heaven. He's the King of heaven. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He knows the end from the beginning because He has declared it. He says, I am the Lord thy God, and besides me there is no other. There is none like Him, right? And we see Him seated, enthroned in glory in, in Daniel chapter 7, and then one comes to Him, and the one who comes to Him is like the Son of Man. Now remember, we told you that's Jesus, right? That's the, that is the most used name that Jesus uses of Himself. He calls Himself the Son of Man more than He calls Himself anything else. The Son of Man. And He does that on purpose because He's harking back to Daniel chapter 7. Now He comes to the throne of the Ancient of Days and He receives something from the throne of the Ancient of Days, right? I want to go to Revelation chapter 5. I want to read this to you because it's, it, 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 it's important. Now, in Revelation chapter 5, this is a vision that John is receiving. He's in the throne room of God, right? He has come to the throne room of God and he's receiving a vision. And it's when he's on the island of Patmos and he sees a vision of Jesus in glory, right? And then he's brought up to the throne room of heaven and he sees something unfolding, now it says here in, in Revelation chapter 5, verse 1, it says, And I saw in the right hand of, of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So remember what the vision that we see in Daniel chapter 5, right? What happens in, I mean, in, in Daniel chapter 7? What happens? The Ancient of Days is seated on his throne, right? He's holding court and there's judgment pouring forth from the throne of the Almighty. Then one is brought near to him. He's called the Son of Man. And he comes near to the throne of the Ancient of Days and he receives something from him. Now look at what's happening in Revelation chapter 5. This is a parallel vision again. John is watching this scene unfold. And the Ancient of Days is seated on the throne and he holds in his right hand a scroll and it's written on the back and on the front and it's rolled up and it's sealed with seven seals. Now often in the Ancient Days they would do this. They would a very important document would be sealed with seven seals. They would roll it up a little bit, they would seal it. They'd roll it up a little bit, they would seal it. And only the one who possessed the authority to open those seals was allowed to un unroll the scroll and to read what was on the scroll. Often they would do this with title deeds to land. You can read about that in Jeremiah. In Jeremiah, a very similar scroll is used to be given as a title deed to land. Now here... The Ancient of Days, God the Father, the Almighty, holds in His hand a scroll, a very important scroll, and it's rolled and sealed seven times. Now they're saying, who is worthy to open the scroll? And there are none found in heaven or on earth or under the earth. No one is found who is worthy to open the scroll or to even look at it because no one has the authority. There's no one found. Now, many commentators believe, and I agree with this, that this is the title deed to the earth. This is the title deed to the earth. We know that the king of the earth right now, I mean, God is the king of kings, right? Jesus is the king of kings already. He's not waiting to become the king of kings. He is the king of kings. But right now, the throne of the kingdom of the earth is occupied by usurpers. And the number one usurper is Satan himself, right? In Ephesians chapter 2, it says that uh, he's the God of this world, right? He's the king of this world. It describes him as having the authority over the system of the world. The system of the world is put in motion by the enemy. Because of the fall of man, sin has entered in, death has entered in, and the enemy has gained control of the throne of the earth. But God, who has ultimate dominion over everything, He holds in His hand the title deed to the earth. He is the true owner of the system of the world. He is the true owner of the earth. He is the creator of the heavens and the earth. He's the owner of it. And He holds in His hand the title deed, and He's offering it up. 
Now there's no one found worthy to take it. Now look at what happens. Verse 4, it says, So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open it and to read the scroll, scroll or to look at it. Now, where it says that he wept much, your, your translation might say bitterly. I wept bitterly. It literally means that he was sobbing. He was sobbing. Here he is in the throne room of the Almighty. All of the amazing things that he's seeing. And it's been on display for us already in the book of Revelation. If you're reading through there, you'll read about this amazing throne room of God. All the focus on the throne. And then, the one seated on the throne holds out the title deed to the earth. A scroll, a very important scroll that needs to be opened. And there's no one worthy to open it. So what happens? John starts to sob. He's weeping. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. So imagine the scene. You've got to understand that right now, what's happening on the earth, in this, at this point, in the book of Revelation, the church has been raptured off of the scene, and the judgment of God is about to be poured forth onto the earth. It's about to happen. God's judgment, His wrath is about to be poured out on the earth, on an unbelieving world. And there is one who has gained the authority to open and to loose the seven seals of this scroll. And it's the lion of the tribe of Judah. It's Jesus himself. Because of the work that he's done on the cross, he has gained the authority. He has won the battle. He has all the right to the, to the throne of the earth. And so God, the Father, holds out the scroll. There's none found worthy except the lion of the tribe of Judah. That's awesome. But look at what happens. And I looked. Verse 6. And behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. Don't get confused by that. That's the sevenfold spirit of God. You can read about that in Isaiah. It's the Holy Spirit. Which, which are the seven spirits of God sent into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now he's about to start to loose the seals. And as he looses the seals, judgment pours forth onto the earth. But imagine the scene here in the throne room, in the midst of this amazing throne room of heaven. God the Father holds out the seal. There's no one found worthy. And then the elder says, don't weep. Because one, the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed to open the scroll. And when John looks to see the lion, when he looks to see the lion in all of its glory, the lion of the tribe of Judah, what does he see? A lamb as though it had been slain. Even in the throne room of heaven, when he sees Jesus, he is a lamb that had been slain. For all of eternity, Jesus will bear the marks of the crucifixion. Jesus will bear the marks of what we did to him. And what he did for us. It will be a constant reminder. I, I, I love it. A, a pastor, a, a commentator that I really love said the only man-made thing in heaven will be the marks of the crucifixion on Jesus. It's an amazing thing to consider, right? But there in the midst of heaven is the lamb as though he had been slain. And he comes to the Ancient of Days and he receives the title deed to the earth and he receives all of the authority to execute judgment on the earth and to come and to set up his throne. I love this scene, man. I love this scene, but just like John, later on in the book of Revelation, you'll see that he takes that book and he eats it. And it's sweet to his lips, but it's bitter to his stomach. Just like John, it's similar for me, man. This is sweet. 
The Word of God is sweet. The Word of God is amazing. This scene is amazing. And I look forward to that day where we watch as Jesus takes that scroll from the Ancient of Days, where we're seated, enthroned in heaven together with Jesus. We're there in the midst of the throne room. We're offering praises unto Him. He receives all of the authority. He receives the title deed to the earth, and He begins to execute judgment. I long for that day. I can't wait for that day. But at the same time, it's bitter to my stomach because I know that there are people that I love right now on earth that will not be there with me. It's sweet to my lips, but it's bitter to my stomach. There are those who you love that will not be there. What is our job? It's to share this truth, right? It's to say, man, there's a day coming where God will pour out His judgment on the earth. you realize that judgment is spoken of in the Bible more than forgiveness? you realize that? It's not that it's more important. It's that it's true. It's that judgment is coming and there's nothing that, you, that, that anyone can do to escape it other than giving themselves over to the truth of who Jesus is. Giving themselves over to the gospel of Jesus and having their soul saved. That's the only thing. Sean prayed it before we started is that we're not appointed under wrath. Why? Because Jesus suffered all the wrath that was appointed unto us. All the wrath and judgment that we deserve to be given to us from God. Jesus on the cross received it for us. He paid the price that we could never pay. He became sin. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be the righteousness of God in Him. He bore on Himself all the shame of our sin. All the selfish things that we've done. All the embarrassing, sinful things that we've done in our life. All the prideful and selfish things that we've done in our life. He became them for us. Because of the great love with which He loved you. Turn back with me to Daniel chapter 7. In verse 14 it says, Then to him, speaking of the Son of Man, then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. We just watched that scene unfold in Revelation chapter 5. As he comes, he receives dominion from the Father. He has already earned it. He's already worthy of it. But there's a timeline in place. So when does, when does this kingdom enter in? When is it that, that the throne of heaven enters into this world? When does Jesus step down again to come and put his feet on earth again to rule and reign with a rod of iron from Jerusalem to set up his millennial kingdom on earth, to set up his eternal kingdom first and foremost is that millennial phase on earth. Then comes the new heavens and the new earth for the eternal, eternal phase. But when does that take place? Well, we've seen the first four empires, right? And that, that, that time where that kingdom enters in is at the final phase of the final empire, right? During the reign of the final ruler of the final phase of the final empire. Now that final empire is Rome. Now Rome is gone, right? I mean, Rome has already come and gone. But we talked about it last week that the system of Rome is still in place. And there will be a rebirth of the Roman Empire. And we'll see this ten kingdom phase of this reborn Roman Empire. Now we're watching that happen right now before our very eyes. It's happening. It's happening. They're occupying now the same region as the ancient Roman Empire. It's, it's taking place. We're seeing the fulfillment of prophecy. So I want to get into the interpretation now in, in Daniel chapter 7, verse 15. It says, I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near to one of those who stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. 
And here's the interpretation, verse 17. Those great beasts, which are four, are four kings which arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. That's the whole interpretation of the vision. Now we're going to go into greater detail, but that's, that's it. That's the overarching theme. That's what the angel says. That vision which you saw, which is now troubling you. Remember, Daniel is troubled. Why? Because this little horn speaking pompous words is warring against the saints of God and he's destroying them. He's been given dominion over them for a time and times and, and half a time. But here he's troubled by it and he goes to one of those who are near, probably an angel. He goes to an angel and he says, what is the deal? What's going on here? And the angel says, look, those four beasts, which you saw, they're four kings. They're going to arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever even forever and ever. I want you to just pause for a second and consider that verse. Because he says, look, this is what's going on. Those four beasts, they're four kings. They're going to reign on the earth for a time. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom. Now think about what we just read in Revelation chapter 5. What we just read in Revelation chapter 5 is the Son of Man comes to the throne. He receives the scroll. He opens the scroll. He's worthy. He receives all authority and dominion. Again, in Daniel 7, verse 14, it says, Then to him the Son of Man was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. Then all of a sudden, the interpretation of the vision is, the saints of the Most High will receive the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Remember what it says in Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8, it says that you've been given the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. It says that now that you've been adopted, your sons, your children, children of God. And if you're children of God, then you're joint heirs together with Jesus to the kingdom. If indeed you suffer with him, that you may also be glorified together with him. Think about what is going on here. Daniel says that when he sees this vision, one comes to interpret the vision for him and says that the saints of the Most High are going to receive the kingdom and they're going to rule and reign forever, even forever and ever. And then in Romans it says that you've been adopted by the blood of Jesus as you've received him in faith, that you've been adopted into the family of God and now you are called joint heirs to the kingdom of God together with Jesus. Are you serious? Can, is that, does that not blow you away? When you consider the reality of that, that one comes to the throne of God, to the Ancient of Days, the Creator of all things, receives the kingdom and then shares it with you. He receives all honor and glory and dominion and a kingdom which shall never fade and He shares it with you. Because you believed on Him. Because He loves you. Because forever, he wants to show the richness of his glory. <coughs> Sorry. In his kindness towards you. He wants to show you the richness of his glory in his kindness towards you. The Bible says that we're going to rule over angels. That we're going to be given authority. That we're going to be given kingdoms. But in all of that, what do we do with it? We cast our crowns at the feet of Jesus. It's all for Him. We give Him all the honor. We give Him all the glory. It says, The four great beasts, which are four, are four kings which arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Then I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others. Exceedingly dreadful, 
with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured broken pieces and trampled the residue with its feet. And the ten horns that were on its head and the other horn which came up before, uh, before which three fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them until the Ancient of Days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. And the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. So he's coming to the angel and he's saying, look, what's the deal? What's going on? The angel gives him this brief kind of summary of the vision and he says, look, those four beasts, four kings, but don't worry because the saints of the Most High are going to receive the kingdom and they're going to reign forever and ever. And then he says, but I want to know more about this fourth beast. Because it's in the reign of the fourth beast that the Son of Man comes to set up his kingdom. So he wants to know about this fourth beast. He wants to know about what's going on. But namely, he wants to know about these ten kings. And among those ten kings, he really wants to know about that little horn. He wants to know about that little horn that grows and becomes more prominent than the others. That before it, three horns fall. Now, when you read that, it sounds violent. When you read about the three horns being uprooted before the little horn, it sounds like this violent altercation, this warring. But really, in the original language, it doesn't give you that impression. Really, it's more subtle. Really, it's more political. That as this little horn comes to authority and he begins to speak pompous words, not only are they blasphemous, but they're very compelling. This little horn is a political genius. He comes on the scene and he confirms a covenant with many nations. Now, it's my opinion that first and foremost, the rapture of the church happens. And when the rapture of the church happens, God is going to turn his attention to Israel. Now, when he turns his attention to Israel, he's going to come to the defense of his chosen nation. Now, in Ezekiel chapter 38, we have the Ezekiel 38 wars. Now, the Ezekiel 38 wars are when all these nations come together and they come against Israel. And they're coming to plunder and they're coming to take the riches of Israel. Now, when this happens, all of these nations come against Israel and no one comes to the defense of Israel. No one. None of the other nations of the world come to the defense of Israel. Now, you might ask yourself, how is it that that could be possible? How is it that no one comes to the defense of Israel? Right now, as it stands, the United States, we would come to the defense of Israel, would we not? We would protect Israel. If all these nations, Russia, Gog and Magog and Turkey, and all these nations come against Israel, we would come to the defense of Israel. So something has to take place. Something has to happen to make it to where all the nations of the earth will not come to the aid of Israel. Now, what could that be? I would say it's the rapture of the church. Think about this. Who is it that wants to come to the defense of Israel? It's evangelical Christians. It's conservative Christians, isn't it? We're the ones who want to defend Israel, knowing that that's God's chosen people, knowing that that's God's chosen nation, knowing that that's the only nation that matters anything to God. We would come to the defense of Israel, would we not? But if all of the conservative Christians are gone... If everyone is off the scene, that opens the door wide for the Ezekiel 38 wars to take place. And when the Ezekiel 38 wars come to take place, God defends Israel. In a miraculous way, all of the nations of the earth know that that was the hand of God. Now there's turmoil. There's all kinds of craziness that breaks loose from this war. And I believe that it's at that time when all the world is turned upside down, when all the Christians are gone and there's turmoil, there's unrest in the whole world, that there is one who steps on the scene speaking peace. He comes with pompous words speaking peace when he says peace and safety. And he has a plan. And then in Daniel chapter 9... It says that he confirms a covenant with many. He even confirms a covenant with Israel. Now, if you ask religious Jews today if they're waiting on the Messiah, they'll say, yes, we're waiting on the Messiah. And then you ask them, what does the Messiah look like? What are you waiting for? And they'll tell you that they're waiting for a man. He does, he's not God. 
but they're waiting for a man who's a strong political leader that will create peace in the Middle East, that will confirm a covenant with Israel, that will allow them to build their temple again. All of these things that they're looking for are, you see them personified in the Antichrist, in the one who is spoken of, this man of sin, the son of perdition, the little horn, the king of fierce countenance, all, the, all, all of the things that they're looking for, you find him, in, you find all of them in him. And he comes on the scene and he is slick tongued and he gets everybody to follow him and he confirms a covenant speaking peace. And I believe that he even allows and even helps Israel to build a temple again. But then he confirms a seven year covenant with Israel and three and a half years in, he breaks the covenant. And he sets himself up in the temple of God and he shows himself that he is God and he demands to be worshipped over all that is called God. Turn with me to 2 Thessalonians. You don't have to turn there. Uh, you can just write it down, but it's important. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He says, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you, not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. That is the Antichrist. He's saying, look, the day where Jesus comes can't happen. Uh, I'm sorry. Where, where it says the day of Christ had come, like, like the church had been raptured. But that day, speaking of the judgment, will not come by any means until the great falling away happens. And then the man of sin is revealed. So that day can't come until the man of sin, the son of perdition, is revealed. Right? The wrath of God can't be poured out on the earth. Remember, right now the Thessalonian church thinks that they're in the tribulation. They think they've missed the coming of Christ. And they say, look, Paul says, look, that day can't come until the man of sin is revealed. And the man of sin can't, and then he gives us a, an explanation of the man of sin. He says, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And then he says, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time, speaking of the Antichrist. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. So he's saying, look, that the wrath of God can't be poured out on the earth until the man of sin is revealed. And the man of sin can't be revealed until the restrainer is taken out of the way. Now, who is the restrainer? Who restrains evil on earth today? It's the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit is the agent of God. The Holy Spirit is God on earth who restrains evil. Now, who is the agent of the Holy Spirit? It's us. He lives within us. He works through us. He works in us and through us in the earth. He, we are the agent of the Holy Spirit. We are the acting agent on behalf of the Holy Spirit. Now remember, Jesus says when he promises the Holy Spirit to us that it will never leave us nor forsake us. So if the Holy Spirit is going to be removed, the one who's now restraining, it has to follow that we are removed with him. Because he can't go anywhere without us. We can't go anywhere without him. If he's removed from the earth, if his restraining power is removed from the earth, the power that restrains evil is removed, then that means we have to go with him. We have to. Because Jesus promises that he will never leave us nor forsake us. Now listen, it's important to recognize that the Holy Spirit is still here during the tribulation. How do I know that? Well, first I know that because he is omnipresent. God is everywhere, all the time, always, right? But also, people get saved during the tribulation. And that is 
only a ministry of the Holy Spirit. You can only be saved when the Holy Spirit draws your heart and takes you from that heart of stone to a heart of flesh and He gives you faith in Jesus. Then you make the decision to say yes to Him, but only after the Holy Spirit does a work on your heart. You can't do it alone. So we know that the Holy Spirit is here during the tribulation because multiple people get saved. Huge numbers of people. There's giant spiritual awakening during the tribulation. So that's a ministry of the Holy Spirit. But the restraining power, the power of the Holy Spirit that restrains evil is removed. Then the man of sin, the son of perdition, comes and he comes on the scene and he confirms a covenant with many. And that's what we see taking place here in Daniel chapter 7. This little horn. He comes on the scene and he begins to speak blasphemous words against God and he sets himself up to be worshipped as God. The last three and a half years of the, great, uh, of the tribulation is known as the Great Tribulation. So the man of sin, the son of perdition, is revealed but only after the restrainer is removed from the earth. I love that. that that's so simple to me. To me, there, there is no debate. I mean, how... The, the fact of a rapture is not debated. We all know that there's going to be a rapture, but it's just the timing of the rapture. But here, I believe, Paul just directly lays out the timing for us right here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It makes it super simple. Again, in 2 Thessal- I mean, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 5, he lays these things out for us again in great detail. And so we see the rapture of the church. Then all hell breaks loose on earth. And this man of sin, this son of perdition that that has risen to power in the final phase of the final empire comes on the scene and he receives all the power and he's given dominion over the earth for a time. For seven years specifically. And it says, uh, verse 23, thus he said, so here is the interpretation. "The The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth which shall be different from all other kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, trample it, break it in pieces. The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom, and another shall rise after them. He shall be different from the first ones, and shall subdue three kings. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, and shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change the times and the law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. Now this is very interesting prophetically, right? This is very interesting to consider. Because here is this little horn. He rises to power, right? This fourth kingdom, different from all the kingdoms that were before it. All these ten kings. And there arises out of the ten kings one who is different than all the other kings. And as he rises to authority and power, he usurps the authority of the three, and then the other, all the other kings lay down their authority to him. And he is an absolute monarch in the last kingdom. He has all of the authority on earth in that last kingdom. But here it says he even prevails against the saints of the Most High for a time and times and half a time. Now what, what is going on here? Now, remember when I said that during the tribulation, there's going to be great spiritual awakening. There's going to be tons of people who come to faith in Jesus during that, during that tribulation period, right? And so those are called the tribulation saints. You can read about them in Revelation, those who come out of the great tribulation. Now, there comes a point three and a half years into the tribulation as he has confirmed a covenant. This Antichrist causes there to be an abomination of desolation and he wants everyone to worship him. And to receive a mark. A mark of the beast, we call it, right? And without this mark, you can't buy or sell. And if you don't take the mark, and the only people who don't take the mark are the people who have faith in Jesus. The only people who don't take the mark is because it's a clear delineation. As you take the mark, there's no one who's going to be fooled or or, or duped into taking the mark. The people who take the mark are making a conscious decision to deny Jesus... And to worship the beast. Deny Jesus and to worship the Antichrist. It's it's a conscious decision. And so anyone who doesn't take the mark are going to be killed, even beheaded, by the Antichrist and his system. And so three and a half years in, as he usurps all the authority, all the power, and he wants to receive worship 
Anyone who doesn't worship him and worship the beast and take his number, take his mark, they are all going to be killed. And he begins to persecute the saints of the Most High. But then it says, and he intends to change times and laws, so he's changing the morality, God's morality. He's changing everything. He's putting everything over on its head. But then it says, then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. What is that? What is a time and times and half a time? Now remember when Nebuchadnezzar went crazy, how long did he go crazy for? Seven times, right? Seven times. Then we look at the Babylonian Chronicles, and there's a period of seven years within the Babylonian Chronicles where Nebuchadnezzar is silent, right? So it makes sense that these seven times would be speaking of seven years. Then when we, he- when we come to here, it would make sense that these time and times and half a time would be Years. A time would be speaking of years. But if you really want to know, you just go to Revelation chapter 9, and it, I mean, I'm sorry, Daniel chapter 9, and it lays it out for you. Time and times and half a time is three and a half years. Very simple. A time is one year. Times, two years. And a half a time is a half a year. So we have a time and times and a half a time. Three and a half years. So it's the last half of this seven-year covenant that was made with the people Uh, with the nations. And so he's given authority to prevail against the saints of the Most High, to to prevail against these uh, tribulation saints, to kill them for three and a half years. But the court shall be seated, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey Him. This is the end of the account. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly troubled me, and my countenance changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. So here's the end. This is the coming of the kingdom of Christ, this eternal kingdom, this kingdom that never fails, that never fades, that goes on forever and forever forever even forever and ever. It comes during the final phase of the final empire, during the, the, uh, during the time where that final ruler of that final phase is ruling. But we're seeing the scene be set for that right now. We're watching it happen. So in the midst of that, what do we do? Do we look for this Antichrist? Do we look for this little horn? Do we look for the one who's coming, speaking pompous words? Do you realize that nowhere in Scripture... Nowhere in the New Testament is the church ever told to be looking for the Antichrist. Ever. We're never told that. Never anywhere in Scripture. If you, look, if you read all of Scripture, you will never be told to be looking for the Antichrist. Who are you told to be looking for? Jesus. He says, when you see these things begin to happen, look up for your redemption draws near. We're watching it happen. We're watching Scripture unfold before our very eyes. We are watching prophecy be fulfilled. And it's during the time of the ten kings when the, ancient, uh, when the stone cut without hands comes. We're watching the setting up of this last kingdom. We're watching the rebirth of the Roman Empire. Now what does that mean for us? That means perhaps today Jesus could come for His church. Do you realize that nothing has to happen for Jesus to come and rapture His church? Nothing. Nothing has to happen. There's no prophecy that needs to be fulfilled. It's a signless event. It could happen right now, today. Now, if that news doesn't excite you, then there's something wrong with your walk, right? You're not in a good place. If the news of Jesus coming for you to take you to that place that he's been preparing for you now for 2,000 years, if that news doesn't excite you, if there's something else that you want more than that, That's an idol in your life. If you say, oh, Jesus, that sounds great, but I want you to wait until this happens. That means you're putting that above the kingdom of God. Our hope is that Jesus is coming again for us. That is our hope. That hope gives us the endurance to run the race well. That hope in eternity, that hope in that heavenly kingdom gives us the endurance to, gives us the patience to endure. All the trials and the tribulations, all the hard things that we go through, that's all okay because we know that Jesus is coming soon and very soon. 
We know that all of this is just a vapor because there's an eternal kingdom that has been, been prepared for us that we are co-heirs to. That Jesus is coming to take us to. Listen, that is our hope. That's what we've been set apart for. That's what we've been set apart to. This eternity together with Him, face to face in perfect communion where there's no distraction where there's no proclivity to sin, where our flesh has dropped away and we've been given a glorified body, where we've been glorified together with Him, where our sins are completely gone, where we're purified before the throne, where we're robed in the righteous acts of the saints and we stand before Him as a perfect bride without spot or wrinkle. That's what we're waiting for. That's what we're longing for as the church. Are you longing for that? Is that the hope of your heart? Jim says it every time I say, hey, how you doing today? Jim says, man, I'm one day closer to heaven. I love that. It's true. That's what we're longing for. I want to show you something about this fourth kingdom that I think is really interesting. Revelation Chapter 13. Now we don't get much of a description of this beast in Daniel. We get more of a description in Revelation 13. Now I want you to remember that the, the beasts that came before them, one was like a lion, one was like a bear, and one was like a leopard. Then this fourth beast is different. Different than all the beasts that had come before it, right? But then it says in Revelation 13, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, again, just like Daniel, right? He's watching these beasts come out of the sea. Here, John is given this vision. He's standing on the sand of the shore of the great sea. And I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. This fourth beast, this final Gentile empire, different than all of the empires that have come before it, but also similar. It's like a leopard. He's got the feet of a bear and the mouth of a lion. This, last, this final Gentile empire is taken from all the empires that have come before it. All of the good from the empires that have come before it. All of the power of the empires that have come before it. He's taken on all of them and yet different than everything that has come before it. More powerful, more dangerous, more uh, stronger, bigger, meaner. And trampling the residue with its feet. But here's the reality. We have not been appointed under wrath. So as this last and final gen phase of the Gentile Empire is coming up and receiving authority, receiving power as it's gaining steam as we're watching that. Look up. <coughs> Jesus is coming soon. Some of the last words of Jesus is, are this. Behold, I come quickly. The imminent return of Jesus. We live in the imminency of the return of Jesus. Daniel says at the beginning of chapter 7 that he wrote down the facts of the matter, right? He wrote down the facts of the vision. He gave us just the facts. And at the end of Daniel 7, he says, This is the end of the account, and as for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly troubled me, and my countenance changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. Later on, it'll say that he seals it up, for it's not for many days from now. Listen. Listen. These prophecies are for us. These prophecies are for now. Do you realize that 30 years ago that people had to guess at what these ten horns would be? They have no idea. How is this going to happen? How are we going to see these nations come together? How is it going to happen? How are people really going to line up to take the mark? How is really any of this going to happen? Listen, we're watching it happen. Do you realize that? We live in an exciting time, one of the most exciting times in all of history. Not only do we have all of this fulfilled prophecy, but we are also living in the time of the fulfillment of prophecy, and we're living in the imminent return of Jesus. We should be excited. Not scared, not worried, not sad, but excited. 
And we should be spurred on by all of these things to speak the truth of the gospel to the world because we know our King is coming soon. And we should be excited to see people coming into the kingdom knowing that Jesus wants more to be saved. The only reason why He hasn't come yet is because He desires that more are saved. He wants to see the people coming into the kingdom. He knows the number of the Gentiles. Listen, if you're the last one that Jesus is waiting on, could you just come, please? Come, man, I'm ready to go home. I'm excited. And you should be excited. Let's pray. Father, we cry with our hearts, Maranatha. We're crying, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Will you just come? Lord, we look forward to that day where we see you face to face. Lord, we're so thankful for prophecy. God, we're so thankful for this book, for Daniel. We're so thankful for this chapter that you've laid out for us the whole course of history, Lord, that we don't have to guess, that we don't have to wonder. Lord, we don't have to think about how things are going to happen, what's going to take place. We don't have to worry about tomorrow, Lord. We know that our eternity is in your hands. Lord, we know that you call us children. We know that you call us sons and daughters. Lord, we're so grateful. Father, I pray that you would just give us strength, Lord, to speak truth. Lord, I pray that you would give us boldness and power to speak your gospel to a lost and dying world. Lord, we can't wait till you call us into the clouds, Lord, till we come to see you face to face when this uh, corrupt will put on incorruption. Lord, we can't wait for that day. But in the meantime, God, Lord, would you just cause us to be faithful? The only thing required of a servant of the Lord is to be found faithful. Lord, we want to be found faithful when you come. God, will you set up divine appointments for us this week, Lord, that we can speak your truth to those who need to hear it? Lord, would you empower us with your Holy Spirit? God, would you comfort us with these prophetic words? Lord, would you commit us of the truth of your word by the power of your spirit? Just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to remind you guys about uh, Harvest Night to be bringing in candy and also to be spreading the word. We've got to get the word out about Harvest Night because if it's just you guys there, what's even the point, right? I'm just kidding. It would still be a great night. But spread the word. Let everybody know about Harvest Night. Invite your friends. Invite friends with kids. We want to bless the city. We want to bless the county. We want to bless the people around us. Um, a lot of people aren't doing things for Halloween this year because of all the craziness, and so we want to shine the light of Jesus on a dark night, right? Amen. You guys be blessed.